our first article will be presented by Raghu Bamaraju from the Ivy College of Business at Iowa State University and Mike Ahern from the Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. Thank you for joining us, Raghu and Mike. Well, thank, thank you very much, Paige. I appreciate it, and uh, uh, thanks for having us today. And we're excited to present our work. Uh, Raghu and I uh, were very excited about this topic when we started out. Uh, you know, we had many conversations with companies about topics around board composition. Uh, Raghu and I do a, a lot of work um, both in the sales and marketing area. And one of the things that's often asked of us is, uh, is where does the marketing input come uh, on the board? How does the, how does the board react in a way to be most effective to get the best input on uh, marketing and, and strategic sales directions for the board of directors. And so uh, we got really interested in this topic and really started to look back at the literature to see if anything had been done on the topic of, of the serving of a customer on the board and, and what would the impact be of having a customer on the board. And fortunately, we were able to assemble some uh, pretty cool data on this topic and we're hoping to show you uh, some details today that may be insightful for you as far as thinking about the value of a customer, uh, particularly in business-to-business -business markets. When does having a customer on the board help? Uh, and what kind of value does it bring? And uh, in, 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 in which ways can a customer actually help to, uh, uh, to influence and or increase the potential uh, of an organization by the service on the board? So um, uh, with, with that being the case, uh, like to uh, to share with you um, sorry I'm having trouble advancing my slide thank you so um, so we we know that the uh, the uh, on the board of directors uh, the board serves a couple of key responsibilities uh, the first responsibility is uh, is monitoring of top management, and that really comes in the uh, in the role of being able to make sure that decisions that are being made are are good decisions, reacting uh, to those decisions, and also working from an ethical perspective of making sure that the top management team is 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 acting in in the correct direction and actually serving uh, the uh, the the best interest of all parties, particularly also the stakeholders. Uh, as well as employees and customers. Um, and uh, so the monitoring function is very important, but also the, the board provides a key service also in that they provide advice and counsel to the, uh, 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 to the leadership team of the organization. And, and oftentimes this is through, uh, through one-off conversations from committees, uh, feedback, uh, board uh, uh, reactions to proposals, uh, and, uh, and so we know that the board it has heavy influence on some of the directions that organizations take. And so we really wanted to be able to understand it, in what ways can marketing uh, really get the value, the potential, maximum potential out and impact the organization's outcomes. So um, we can move forward. The, uh, so the, uh, uh, so one of the things that we, we noted, and it's really interesting to be able to see, is that, uh, is that in reaction to a number of ethical challenges, in particular, uh, we see like uh, Sorbanes-Oxley, for example, and, uh, and other challenges that occurred in the marketplace, um, one of the things that, that it used to be, if you looked historically back on boards, most boards were actually composed of uh, individuals who are insiders in the organization itself. That is, for example, chief financial officer um, and uh, uh, chief marketing officer, the team uh, leadership in the sales organization, leadership in finance. Uh, so these individuals actually compose the boards. And uh, with the Sorbanes-Oxley Act, it sort of expanded uh, the role of the board and it put more oversight uh, reg regulations or requirements on the board and put some um, rules in place as to the way that board composition be set, should be set up. So um, it said, firstly, that the majority of the directors should be independent. Um, and, and that's interesting because the independent directors being not members of the senior management team, 
could act as watchdogs, that is, look over the best interest of that board and provide input on it. Now, that, that, led to a, that leads to a bit of a challenge because m many boards are actually composed of individuals who are outside the industry itself. So they served on either leadership teams or senior management positions in other organizations, but in, in other industries that aren't really doing business the same way as that company is doing business. So, for example, you may have a, a CEO from an IT organization or senior management, uh, former senior management leaders from an IT organization serving on a consumer packaged goods firm's uh, senior, senior leadership on the uh, board. And uh, uh, so that board membership, because that's not directly, you know, these individuals may be able to give advice and suggestions and oversight, but they don't have the depth knowledge of really the work, the inner workings of that industry itself. So, uh, so, so that that poses a bit of a challenge and a trade-off of having the insider versus the outsider. Now, they also said the sorbonne Oxley also said the boards must have a finance expert on the board as well, from an oversight perspective, to help out in, in, in looking at the oversight and best practices to make sure that there's no uh, issues as far as finance-related issues on the board itself. So if we move uh, to the next slide. So the, uh, the uh, customer on the board, uh, you know, when we start talking about that as, as far as a customer on the board, one of the things we wanted to look at is, is, you know, is it possible for a company to have customers on the board? Because we've heard examples of customers. And by looking at the rules, basically what it says is that, uh, it, is that the requirements are that a customer cannot uh, uh, compose more than 5% of the total revenue or the total business uh, of that firm um, to qualify for board membership. So as, as long as they're less than 5%, uh, even though they're doing some business with that particular customer, they can serve on the board and still be considered to be independent of that board. And in fact, there are a number of organizations who have decided, in fact, there's about a third of the companies we looked at, and we'll get into to some more details on that, but about a third of the companies we looked at have that uh, combination. So for example, uh, we see that uh, um, for uh, um, Cisco, um, uh, you would see uh, the, uh, in Cisco, Wendy's uh, CEO serves on the board of Cisco. And you would also see for Dow, uh, Unilever serves on the board of Dow, uh, the CEO from Unilever. So what you'd see is it's, it's not uncommon uh, that a senior leader from a customer organization serves on the board of another organization. And if you think about the value that that might bring, these individuals could bring a lot of insight and or thought on, on, on customer reaction. But also, uh, if you think in business-to-business -business markets, uh, we have to think downstream as well and the value that they bring from, uh, from downstream as well. So let me talk about a few of the pros and cons or trade-offs of having this customer. From the pro side, um, they're going to bring firm and industry knowledge for sure. So be because they have that experience directly in that industry itself, they're going to be able to bring insights that are unique and thoughts on that uh, industry that maybe the firm hasn't been thinking about and or anticipating. Uh, they also are very customer focused because they're thinking about what is it going to impact the customers? How, is, how are these decisions going to impact that, that group as a stakeholder? And they also bring knowledge that maybe the other board members don't have uh, that are sitting there as far as the customer's insight on the way decisions impact them into the market. So there's a lot of pros on that side. On the con side, you have a, a potential conflict of interest because Although, like I, I mentioned, that it, it, it is constrained because less than 5% of, of the business would come from that customer, it still constitutes something where a, a little bit of a potential conflict where that customer could have their own best interest at heart. Um, we, we, uh, although in our conversations we don't see that with, with companies, that is a potential con on that side. And also, um, you may have negative reaction from other customers noting the fact that that potential uh, cu customer is on the board, uh, which could th they may think serves as a bias in a favor of one customer over another. So um, there's definitely a trade-off on the pros and cons, 
And we wanted to be able to study whether this presence on the board uh, is really impactful. So we really asked, asked a couple of questions here. The first is, is it valuable uh, to have a customer on the board? So actually, what, uh, how do we quantify uh, the impact of really having it? We know that approximately a third of these companies have a customer on the board. Is there value brought to doing so? And then secondly, uh, it, if it is valuable, uh, when is it the most valuable? Under what, uh, under what conditions or what situations? And so we address both of these. And now I'm going to pass off to Raghu so that he can talk a little bit about the quantitative analysis we ran and the findings uh, in this research. Uh, thank you, Mike. So I'll briefly talk about the method that we used and where we got the data, et cetera. And then finally, I'll show you some of the interesting results that we found. So we started with a sample of uh, S&P 900 firms. Uh, and within this sample, we initially determined which are predominantly the business-to-business -business firms because that's the main focus of our study because in a B2C context, it doesn't really make sense to have bring an individual customer onto the board. So we focused our efforts more on the B2B space, which is also much more complex, uh, at least uh, in the, on the demand side. So we looked at the we looked at the B2B firms, and then within these firms, we gathered information on the directors, financial information, etc. So our final sample consisted of 329 firms over a period of nine years, from 2007 to 2015. Uh, we used a simple regression model with an instrumental variable to identify the impact of having a customer on the board on firm performance. And we measure firm performance using Tobin's Q, which is approximately the market value of the firm divided by the book value of the firm. Uh, so what we find uh, interesting is that, as Mike uh, has mentioned already, that one in three firms actually have a customer on the board. So frankly, when we started the project, we never expected to see such a high number of customers sitting on the board of the firm. So we were kind of surprised to see that result. But within this one in three customers, we actually found that most of them, almost like 92% of them, contribute less than 1% of the revenues. So whereas the regulation stipulates that if you, you can be still be an independent director if you have less than 5%, but firms are actually choosing not really big customers to sit on the board. Uh, I think this is really valuable, and so this kind of elevates any concerns of conflict of interest. So, for example, you don't have, uh, let's say, Walmart sitting on the P&G's board. So those issues are, are rare. So we haven't seen any such cases where you have, like, a huge customer sitting on the board. So next, let me show you some basic results that we found in our research. So we actually found that firms that have a customer on the board seem to have better performance. So specifically, we see that the Tobinsky of the firms increases by around 11% in the years when in which they have a customer on the board compared to when they don't have a customer on the board. Let me show and give you a small example here. So this is the Tobinsky of Sentient Technology. So they manufacture uh, colors, fragrances, and flavors. For most of the years, this firm had a customer on the board. Uh, as you can see, its Tobin's Q after the financial crisis in 2007 or 8 has decreased uh, along with the other market uh, firms. But after 2009, you can see that it, ha it was able to uh, come back and sustain its growth. And especially in the last three, four years, it has exhibited a tremendous growth. So when you compare this with some of its competitors, you can see there is a clear difference in terms of the performance. Of course, we are not attributing the entire improvement in performance just to have a customer on the board. Uh, we do account for other firm level changes, industry level changes, or maybe some macro level changes uh, in our regression model. So we, after including all of, uh, after including or considering all of these factors, we are able to tease out the effect of just having a customer on the board. So having answered the first question, which is, is it valuable to have a customer on the board, for which our response, or at least our finding is that, yes, it is valuable to have a customer on the board. So the second question that we had is, 
So when is it most valuable to have a customer on the board? So we find three different scenarios where having a customer on the board might be more or less valuable. So the first scenario is if the firm is facing high demand uncertainty, that is you have customers whose needs are constantly changing or evolving. In that scenario, it is really valuable to have a customer on the board. Uh, so it makes sense because when you have your customer needs and wants are changing frequently, if the director is able to bring that information to the table at an early stage, it definitely gives a competitive advantage to the firm. So that's what we find, that if you are facing high demand uncertainty, maybe the firm should consider having a customer on the board. The second, uh, however, if the firm is highly diversified, so the firm operates in multiple business segments which are not necessarily related, in that scenario, having a customer on the board is less valuable compared to a firm which is less diversified. So, so again, the logic is, I think, pretty straightforward here. So if, you have, if you're operating in many different segments which are unrelated, the input that the customer brings from one of the segments may or may not be applicable to other business segments. So we find that when the firm is highly diversified, the customer on the board is less valuable. The third, probably a really interesting finding that we got is when you have a customer on the board, it is more valuable if you bring an executive from the customer organization than just additional independent director. So if, uh, so if you want to bring, let's say, a CEO of the, from the customer firm that is more valuable than bringing an independent director sitting on the board of the firm. So uh, board connections may not be that useful if if that person is actually just a director on both the firms instead of an executive at the customer firm. So what are the main three, what are some of the key takeaways from our research? So we offer three important insights or takeaways from our research. The first one we say is that customers can actually be a valuable board member. Okay. So the idea of customer co-creation, which has become very popular in the last decade or so, is mainly in the new de new product development space. So uh, I think companies are realizing that actually uh, co-creating products, co-creating or uh, developing new products we, along with the customers is valuable both for the customers and also for the firm itself. But this idea of co-creation has been more, mainly restricted in the space of new new product development space. What we argue or at least what we find in this research is that you can actually leverage the customer information, knowledge, and experience and bring customers to the strategic table. So bring them to the boardroom where firms make many important decisions. And by participating in those strategic decisions and getting that in useful information, customers can actually uh, help the firm perform very well. So the second uh, insight or the key takeaway that we have is for the regulators and the shareholders. So we would uh, encourage them to distinguish between informed and uninformed directors. So, so just having an independent director is not sufficient. So that person should be able to understand the firm and industry and only then the person will be in a position to actually monitor or give advice to the management. If you bring people from totally unrelated industries, it might be difficult for them to gain knowledge about that particular firm. And since they are executives at their own firms, they don't really have time to invest in learning about this organization. So this creates uh, what is called as the information deficiency at the board level. Where So if you have uninformed directors, they are they may not be in a position to actually monitor the top management team. But uh, by bringing an informed director, like a customer who definitely understands how the firm creates value, can is in a be much better position to both monitor and also give advice and counsel to the top management team. So we encourage the regulators and shareholders to push for uh, not just for independent independence directors, but also informed independent directors. And the last part that, uh, so last recommendation that we have is, we understand that it may not be possible for every firm to bring a customer on the board. So in that scenario, uh, you can, 
uh, actually form a customer committee where maybe two or three directors participate in the customer committee and they maybe go for a customer field trip. They try to understand the customer needs and how uh, the customer industry is evolving. So, uh, so with that, I'll conclude my presentation and we'll be happy to take if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Raghu and Mike. Uh, we do have time for questions from our participants. And again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can type your question in the Q&A tab, not in the studio chat tab, in the audio box to your left. And I see we have some coming in. Uh, first question, do customers on the board have an influence on advertising and or R&D spending? Okay. Uh, Mike, I can take that question. Sure. Go ahead, Raghu. Yeah, so uh, the, thank you for that question, Paige. It's really an interesting question. So what we find is that if you have a customer on the board, you're more likely to invest more uh, in the R&D spending. So your R&D intensity, which is R&D divided by sales, is higher for firms that have a customer on the board. So we actually think that might be one of the mechanisms through which customer on the board is able to influence the firm performance. So as regards to the advertising, so since major, uh, almost all of these firms are since B2B, uh, we had some data limitations. So many of them don't report their advertising spending, or even if they report it is very, uh, it is not very systematic. So we do find an effect on R&D though. Great, thank you. Uh, another one's come in. Why do firms prefer smaller over larger customers on their boards? Uh, Raghu, I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll take that question. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so uh, as you will see, and, and this is actually one of the things that we did on this is uh, is after we had run this analysis, we went to some boards to be able to talk to them to ask some of their reactions uh, to findings, board members to see our what our findings were, what the thoughts were, and um, and one of the things that we know, for example, first. Is, is that that it's obviously it's, uh, companies are constrained legally to not have a customer that represents more than 5% uh, of the total revenue on the board. But that actually can be substantial, as you can imagine. And so what we find in the data, again, is that most companies, it's rare to find a company that has a, a customer that represents one, more than 1%. And so what, what I think what we have here is we have customers that are doing enough business that they understand uh, the industry and the company itself in a unique way, but yet not so much business uh, that, it, uh, that it represents a apparent conflict of interest or even causes conflict with other customers that may perceive them to have um, some sort of competitive advantage um, to, to them in the marketplace simply by that board membership or that relationship. So, so there's, uh, there's both a, uh, uh, because of the transparency uh, that's required and the amount of information that, that, that the other customers can view on this, uh, it, it just, I think it just makes sense that firms have smaller customers uh, representing and are able to leverage that knowledge from that customer relationship. Great. That makes sense. Uh, here's an interesting one. Does the presence of a CMO in the top management team substitute or complement a customer on the board? Uh, Mike, Raghu, I can take that. Like sure, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Paige. That's really an interesting question. Actually, we were examining that in our analysis as well. So what we find is that it's actually in neither. So having a customer on the board is not a substitute for having a CMO or it doesn't complement either. In other words, we see that both of them have their own independent effect on firm performance. So uh, at least our reasoning for that is that maybe the way that the board operates compared to what uh, role of a CMO, they are at a two different levels, and that's why maybe we are able to see an independent effect but not necessarily a substitution. Mike, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think I think that's a really nice implication too, if you think about it, because what it says is that uh, what they bring to the board may actually not be redundant or overlapping type of capability. Um, so there's it's it's like an additive effect. 
So you having a CMO and having a customer both bring unique value to that board that can increase the performance of the firm. Great. So uh, one more question I think we have time for. How would or could you extend your findings to B2C companies? So Raghu, would you like to take that one? I know that you've uh, considered that some. Yes. So uh, th that's an interesting question, Paige. Uh, so first of all, I think this information deficiency issue at the B2C level might be less uh, compared to in the B2B context. At least that's what we believe because in the B2B space, your customers itself are another business group which might be much more difficult for the directors to understand. But in a B2C context, if the director is willing to spare some time, they might actually be buy, able to buy the product and maybe at least use it on a trial basis. So we think this issue of information deficiency at the board level might be less prone at, in the B2C context. So, but having said that, we don't really have much uh, data to justify that. Uh, but if you, if you were to extend this in the B2C context, I think an ideal situation would be to form a customer committee, like you have like a finance committee, audit committee. I think it's uh, high time the firms actually form a customer committee, maybe with a couple of directors from the board, and these directors can spend some time independently of the top management team to learn about their customers and what is changing in the customer's industry, how the firm is doing well or not doing well, and bring that information directly to the boardroom. Uh, so this way, I think they will have more fresh information than which is feeded by the top management team who not necessarily have an incentive to share what is not going well within the firm. Great. Well, I want to thank you both again, Raghu and Mike, for presenting this really interesting research.